Thank you, Marty. You hear me okay? We can. Excellent. So uh, as Marty pointed out, I'm going to be uh, joined by Kelly Larson, who is our lead social scientist uh, at CAP. And so I'll kick things off and then I will pass the, hopefully the Zoom mic over to Kelly. Site news. The only real site news that I have is that we are frantically working, feverishly working, conscientiously working on our CAP 5 proposal, which is due in early March. Um, we, <clears throat> we have six very solid research questions that we're very excited about. Um, environmental justice and equity have wo woven their way through most of those research questions in a, in a really wonderful way. We have a new conceptual framework that we're excited about and that I'm not going to show you today. Um, and I, I'm showing you the framework that is guiding our current CAP4 research uh, just to point out a few things. And the first one of those is that for the roughly 24 years CAP has been around, we have always focused on humans as much as we focus on nature in the city. And our conceptual framework clearly shows that within the urban ecosystem is everything human. And so it is very much about human environment interactions and it requires a very broad social ecological approach. Um, Kelly's gonna spend some time talking about some of the uh, ecosystem services and disservices work that we've been doing, which connects the, the nature in the city to human outcomes. Um, and then another bridge between the human and the nature in the city in our conceptual view of urban ecosystems is urban ecological infrastructure, or what we call UEI. Um, I don't wanna go into any detail about what UEI is. If you wanna come into the breakout room and, and talk with us more about that, we can. Um, suffice it to say that our definition of UAI is all inclusive of nature in the city. Anything that can support ecological structure and function is considered UEI. And so effectively it is everything except the built environment. <clears throat> so one of the things that we introduced in CAP4 fairly early in CAP4 um, is a new move towards looking at human environment interactions in terms of what I call charismatic wildlife or charismatic megafauna. Um, we set up 50 wildlife cameras in the 6,400 square kilometer CAP study area, which you see on the left there, um, and have data from these along a, very, a number of very distinctive urban to rural gradients um, from pre-pandemic as well as pandemic. And so what we found with this wildlife occupancy work, um, which is very data intensive, as you might imagine, um, is that most urban wildlife or most wildlife in central Phoenix or central Arizona um, show a negative relationship with the degree of urbanization. And you can see that in the graphics on the bottom there. Mule deer and bobcat don't really like humans all that much or they try to avoid humans. Um, interestingly enough, coyotes are much more comfortable um, with, with humans in terms of their occupancy relative to the, the urban uh, gradi gradients of urbanization. Um, the wildlife camera trap <clears throat> work has recently been reconfigured and we are doing our wildlife work um, from two different perspectives. One is along an east-west rural to urban to rural gradient through the valley um, in the Salt River itself, uh, which is a natural conduit for wildlife, wildlife movement. Um, but then we have 20 wildlife cameras that we've set up in um, 20 different urban parks um, that are adjacent to neighborhoods of a wide variety of socioeconomic and demographic characteristics. Um, <clears throat> and so that's where we're going to take our urban wildlife work into CAP5. And at this point, I will pass the Zoom podium over to Kelly. Good afternoon, folks. I'm excited to be here and I wish I could share with you, we could share with you so much more of the work that we've been doing at CAP LTER, but I'm going to focus today on demonstrating how our research employs ecosystem services framework and um, urban ecological infrastructure as a way to link social and ecological dynamics. And so here you see individual variables that we've gathered through the Phoenix Area Social Survey. This is 2017 data to evaluate the extent to which residents perceive their local neighborhood environments as contributing to array of social and ecological benefits, as well as negative impacts, including disservices on the right. Um, I don't show it here, but I will mention that we have demonstrated how disservices, perceived disservices are higher in low income neighborhoods, whereas services are higher in high income neighborhoods. So here we've, uh, I'm showing ag how we've aggregated individual variables to create more reliable composite survey scale that reflect particular types of services and disservices. 
So in this case, we have averaged variables to reflect on the positive side, biocultural services. And this is a natural looking landscapes that provide a variety of plants as well as habitat for birds. And then on the disservices side, we have messy looking landscapes that are weedy and attract unwanted species. So then recently with our postdoc, Jeff Brown, we examined which types of urban ecological infrastructure as shown here are associated with perceived services and disservices. And what we found is that nearness to desert preserves and local environments with more vegetation as measured by the NDVI are linked to perceived biocultural services, whereas nearness to the Salt River Channel, which remains dry most of the year or is ephemeral due to upstream storage of water in a series of dams, as well as cropland and vacant land are associated with these biocultural disservices from our survey data. And another paper led by postdoc uh, Jeff Brown, these same urban ecological infrastructure, that is wetlands, agriculture, and vacant lands, were associated with perceived mosquito problems in and around people's homes. We also found that perceived messiness is more strongly associated with perceived mosquito problems as compared to actual mosquito abundance. So altogether, this work demonstrates the subjectivities involved with residents' perceptions of their local home environments in relation to on the ground environmental features and conditions. Um, as far as next steps, as Dan mentioned, we have the renewal proposal coming up and are well in the throes of working on that for 2021. And hot off the press as of last week, we now have our 2021 past data in in hand and are excited to focus on long um, longitudinal analyses, time series analyses of the survey data in the context of our social ecological approach. So thanks for your attention. It's a pleasure to be here.